and and we're on. And we're on. Okay. So uh, today on Sales Intersections season finale, season three, we have quite the special guest. It's a guy I think I wouldn't mind walking around an amusement park for a day eating pretzels, um, having conversations, actually. Not sure how, how, how we should spend going over Larry Long Jr.'s accolades, but let's start with him being named Salesforce. Salesforce's top influencer of 2021. He's CEO, Chief Energy Officer, um, and I can't, I, I can't accentuate the energy part of that, um, uh, of, of LLJR, international keynote speaker, author of the book, Jolt, and I'll let you get into that if you want. Um, for me, it was, it was, it, it's really about getting people to where they should be, where they potentially can be, um, released in May. And, and many others. So I want to add how much credit you get. And I also want to add how much credit you give to your mentors. I think that's really important. And some and sometimes the people who seem uh, to to not need it. Um, but we, we, let me ask you, uh, uh, Larry, what I mean, there's 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 the, the LinkedIn about me. There's a Twitter about me. There's the probably the book uh, about me. Um, but what would you say you're most proud of? What or, or, or more, more, what more or less defines your, your success? Eric, I appreciate it. Uh, can you hear me? I just want to make sure my microphones yeah. are on. <laughs> one, of, one of the three is working. <laughs> I appreciate you hosting me on the sales intersection. So uh, about me, what, what, what I'm most proud of is really having an, an actual impact positive impact on people, on organizations. And those are just the ones that tell me, but I, I intentionally, my goal in life, and there's a quote by Martin Luther King Jr. And, and what he says is life's most urgent and persistent question is, what are you doing to help others? And I ask myself that every day. And I try to live each and every day doing something positive to impact others' lives. So that's what I'm most proud of, Eric, is that I set this intention, I set this goal, and it seems like most days I can answer that question, check, that I actually did something to help someone else out. And, and a lot of times it's in a business capacity, is it not? I, I would say it's, it's professional, it's personal, it's really all around. I, I try to live my life, whether I'm at my son's baseball game, my, my daughter's gymnastics practice, uh, whether I'm speaking to an organization in person. I'm currently in New York, just did a mid-year sales kickoff where we talked about new perspectives, where we talked about how to navigate chaos, uncertainty, and turbulence. So really, I try to do this all around. So kind of a big fan of behavioral cognitive therapy. Um, not, I'm a psychology major, so I'm, I'm a psychology nerd, but, but that, that, that voice in your head that, that can either send you down the rabbit hole, right? Yeah. Or cement that rabbit hole, build a brick house over it and, and say goodbye to it. Um, my question to you is, um, how, how did you pick that path versus, let's say, uh, maybe being a therapist or something like that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, to be honest, I wouldn't say I selected this path. This path was selected for me. I, I've been talking since I came out the womb and now <laughs> I have the opportunity to talk, to serve, to support others in a business capacity, in a personal capacity. Uh, and no, I'm not licensed. I'm not a, a clinically licensed therapist, and I would never portray that I do therapy, but I do help serve people to tap into their inner greatness. To, you, must, to you, you, you must have been kicked out of class many times for talking, right? Am I, am I, am I right about that? Spot on. I used to get sent to detention. My parents would be <laughs> called for talking. And now it's my livelihood. It's how I make a living talking, serving, uh, and really listening. Uh, I would say that, that the session that I just did was probably 45% 
of me listening to them and me helping to guide them. We had three hours, me helping the, to me helping them to guide them to their answers. Their answers are different from my answers. Basic, yeah, but basic sales, right? I mean, you don't go into a room and spray and pray. You got you to listen and contextualize the, the answers based on what, 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 they, what they say. You know, I, I remember saying, Larry, I wanted to be, and this is in high school, I told my principal I wanted to be a motivational speaker when I grew up. And I was humbled. My, my principal said, Eric, you know, you're going to need to talk about something that you've done that motivates people. And I, I wasn't there yet. So, I mean, you're a motivational speaker. What, what, how did you get started? What, what was it that motivated people, um, you know, without, you know, maybe, you know, being a fireman and, and, and saving, you know, three people in a, in a, in a house that was burning? Yeah, I've, I've always gotten feedback about my energy and my positive attitude. And uh, when you think about mindset, you think about motivation, you think about energy, that internal drive and desire, that's mostly what I speak about, mindset, motivation in the sales capacity. And before it was baseball, I used to talk to little leagues all the time about the details, about making sure that you listen to your parents, to your teachers, because if you can't listen to them, how can I expect you to deliver in the bottom of the ninth inning for Little League in the bottom of the sixth inning? If you can't even do the little things, how can you do the big things? But so that's that a into the business world. And I absolutely love it. Being able to have an actual, tangible, positive impact on people uh, and to get paid. That's I've been doing this my whole life. The biggest difference now is this is how I earn my living. I get paid to support people and help them get to that next level, to help them step into their inner greatness, to help them get unstuck by giving them a jolt. It's electric. Jolt. Jolt. Okay, man. I'm gonna put it on my I'm gonna put it on my short list. I promise you. <laughs> um, so I mean, did you always have it? I mean, did you always you came out of the you said you came out of the womb talking, but did you did you was there a time when you, you know, you saw a therapist or you read a book or you had a mentor or um, where you had to learn that behavioral kind of uh, cognitive therapy, um, that, that positive attitude, or is it, it nurture versus nature? I mean, you know, how, how much of that do you, do you, you know, prescribe to? I, I, was, I was born, I think I was born like this. We used to live in Grand Island, Nebraska, and I was young. I think I was maybe four or five years old. And my mom said, everyone is scared for their life because of the twisters. We had tornadoes coming through. We lived in an apartment complex, so you have to go down in the basement. I'm a little nappy-headed kid running around, happy as can be. They were like, calm down, little fella. We're, we're, we're just hoping to live. So, I mean, I've had this positive attitude, and it really, I attribute it to my father, who wasn't as outwardly uh, rambunctious as me, but he had the ultimate optimistic attitude. My father grew up in Baltimore City, uh, only one from his family to graduate high school. He was surrounded by crime, uh, just bad stuff, drugs, and he found his ticket out through track. He was a long jumper and triple jumper, shorty long. So wow. to see him operate and to see him come from an environment where there were very low expectations and to see him progress to get his undergraduate, his master's degree and ascent to the highest. He was the uh, director of recreational therapy for Department of Veterans Affairs. So to wow. be able to witness that had a huge impact. And then my mom, my mom didn't have a college degree and she had great success in, uh, in, in her professional career with Department of Veterans Affairs. So being able to see that each and every day, I think there's a saying, you can't be what you can't see. Yeah, I was able yeah. to see those positive role models and That's I was able story. to not just hear from them, but see their actions. That's quite a story about your dad. That's, uh, I, I know I, I, I listened to some of your podcasts and I know that he was was a major influence on your life and uh it seems like you're very fortunate to have to have uh that that is part of uh 
you know, your upbringing and, and influence. Um, let me ask you this. I, I have uh, some things I want to get into, but, um, you know, I have an agenda. But if you were going to come on my show today and you want to discuss something that's hot on your mind that, that you think is interesting, that should be talked about sale, should be talked about in sales right now, what would that be? Eric, let's keep it real. We're going through some tough times right now. You look yeah. at the worldview. There's a lot of stuff. I don't know if HR is listening in, but there's a lot of stuff that's going on and impacting sales professionals, sales leaders worldwide, whether it's a recession, a war, um, a national war, uh, human rights, civil Trump. rights, a lot of stuff. I'm a big believer in controlling the controllables. And I'm also a big believer that tough people are greater than tough times. They say we might be entering a recession. I don't know. I don't know the answer. But I do know that, hold up, who's that knocking? Opportunity is knocking right now. <laughs> the it's, it's knocking. Are you going to take advantage of the opportunity? Or are you going to sit in the corner, twiddle your thumbs, and say, woe is me? Have a Someone's going to take advantage of it. So for all your listeners, my question is, what you going to do in the rest of 2022? And yeah. I'm going to challenge you who you're going to be in 2023. And those are two questions that, do you have an answer to it? What are you doing do you right have, now? Do you have that five-year plan? You have like a five-year plan, two-year plan? Or, or I've, do you I've got a one for me. I've got a one year and a three year. And that's pretty much my guiding star to what I'm doing now. Coming from Influence, National Speaker Association Conference, I'm starting to reconfigure. I, I learned that I need to get more intentional in terms of my plan B. What if we get another pandemic to start off 2023? What impact does that have on me personally and my family? What impact could that possibly have on my business? And what can I do right now to prepare for the worst. Oftentimes, and when COVID presented, we were caught off guard. Whoa, what do we do? We got to do the Zoom thing. What is this? I know in my industry, motivational speaking, a lot of speakers went extinct. They're not here anymore, Eric. As a sales professional, how do you make sure that you still continue to fill your funnel even when the economy is on a downturn? How do you get closer to your clients? How do you make sure that you're there to serve and they know that you're there with their best interests? A lot of times we have our best interests uh, central. <laughs> no, I want that customer centricity. How do you show them? Not, not just talk a good game, but how do you show that? There's some tangible steps that you can take and you should be taking. And that's that's been my biggest observation, the difference between the good kind of average versus the great. It really is the little things. It's the yeah. little things that we can all do, but for some reason or another, most people don't do it. I'll give you an example. LinkedIn. How many people leverage LinkedIn and leverage LinkedIn video, LinkedIn audio, LinkedIn GIFs, GIFs, LinkedIn documents? So many people are missing such a grand opportunity to connect with their prospects, with their clients. Why? Laziness. It takes work. It takes intentionality. It's a choice. There's, there's yeah. a definition, I think, of insanity. Keep doing what you're doing and expecting different results. Yeah. That's insane. I mean, and, and, I, and I think, you know, some people are better at different mediums on LinkedIn than, than others, right? I, I found my niche with, with, with podcasting and I got a following and, and, you know, I can, I can talk about my episode here with you today and the meaning it's sales intersection, the intersection of money and meaning and, you know, what it, what it means to me and then follow up on, on, on those, uh, you know, those conversations. So, I mean, find your niche, you know, I, I'm trying to expand that as well, but I'll give you two, I'll give you two um, quotes that I really like is if you can't take the boredom of consi consistency, then forget about success. And another one is Denzel Washington. He said, you know, I want you at night, I want you to put your shoes so far under the bed 
that when you wake up, you got you got to get on your knees and and crawl under the bed to get those shoes. And that's 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 one that I I I have it hanging up on my wall actually. It's it's, it's a beautiful quote. So um, uh, uh, we'll we'll play it quick here, and then I have some uh, kind of uh, trigger fire questions that I, I want to ask you. We'll keep it in the next ten minutes. But um, um, I've I've mainly worked at startups, uh, yep. most of which were acquired. I did work at Salesforce for a while, um, and I've noticed that sales enablement is is very different. For um, for each startup, um, once you get a little bit more corporate, let's say you go to a Gardner or a Salesforce or a Cisco or a Dell, you know, you know, big names, Google. Um, it's 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 you know, um, it's it's a little bit methodical and um, formulaic, right? Um, but at a startup, it's you you never know what you're going to get. Um, what what would you say about that? I mean, I I put a lot of uh, I I I I think that it's very important to to start off. Well, first I'll say there's there's a negative association with sales. You line up nine out of ten people uh, and and you ask them their association with sales. It's going to be negative usually. And do you think that's because? Um, only four percent of of colleges offer a, a sales oriented curriculum, and fifty seven percent of college graduates end up in a sales job. Or do you think that it's maybe partly because there's not enough sales enablement um, that 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 is involved in in startups, or maybe otherwise, maybe bigger companies, but usually bigger companies have have a two week, three week boot camp or something like that. So I, I've just noticed, I consult with companies and I've, I've just noticed that one, they don't know if they should hire a VP of sales first uh, or a SDR or what order they should, they should be um, uh, uh, hiring. And, and, and usually the conversation doesn't come up about sales enablement, but what, what, what are your thoughts on sales enablement? And how early do you think that should, should be involved in the, in the process? Great question. And I love sales enablement. I work closely with the sales enablement leader here at this company, but it varies. I mean, and that, that's just a generic answer. Every organization is different, but in terms of sales support, sales ops, sales enablement, it's vital, whether it's onboarding, continuing education, whether it's the tech stack, whether it's making sure that the sales reps are empowered uh, and have the necessary resources, absolutely vital. Now, the timing of when sales enablement comes to fruition, that varies. There's a ton of factors. Now, you mentioned the negative perception of sales, and I love it. When I define sales, I think of two things. I think it's a transfer of energy, and you don't have to have dynamite energy. Dynamite, like me, but people... <laughs> People can smell BS from a mile away. They can tell whether you believe in what you're selling and they're, they're buying you. The second definition is playing matchmaker. You're matching your product, your service, your thoughts, your ideas with someone else's needs, wants, desires, challenges, hopes, dreams, aspirations. How do you get there? You ask questions to find out, is there a potential match there. And I think that's what selling is. I think what gives sales the bad name. And I apologize if anyone works at a mall kiosk, but I go to the mall kiosk now that things have opened up and they want to squirt lotion in my hand. I'm not Ashy Larry, Eric. Not today. I, I moisturized. I don't need lotion. Yeah, my yeah. hands are silky and smooth. I went to I the car lot. I was looking for a minivan. I got two kids. I'm trying to fit the pack and play. I'm trying to fit the golf clubs in. They tried to get me in a sports car. I said, no, are yeah. you not listening? You're serving yourself. Ready to do a deal? No, I need a minivan. You didn't listen to a word that I said. So you I think it. that's where the negative connotation comes with sales as well as sales is tough. And there's some bad agents out there that are messing it up for the real, true sales professionals that are doing things the right way, that are looking are you, to serve. 
Yeah, there there are great. I mean, you can clean up your feed and see just pure value, or you can see pure garbage. But are you familiar with James Braun? Uh, Josh, I know Josh. I mean, jo I'm sorry, Josh Braun. I didn't know if that was his twin brother, James. No, no, he doesn't. He doesn't. No, they don't switch out and uh, <laughs> and go go every other day. Big, big fan jo of Josh Braun. He, jo he's, uh, Josh he's Braun. He has he has a saying called "Zone of Resistance." And, and that's, that's the kiosk example he actually uses was someone comes up and says, hey, can I, can I offer you a Motorola phone? Can I, uh, and, and they're like, no, 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 no. So I, I totally get that. Um, so I'm gonna conclude here with some, some rapid fire questions. Um, what, do you, what do you think um, outside of work um, one-ups your game, um, you know, w w whether it's uh, working out, family, whether it's uh, maybe faith, maybe it's um, whatever it may be. What do you think uh, one-up one your game? One, yeah, one for, up your me, game. For, for me personally, it's family. And I mean, all the above, but I always ask people, motivation, where does yours come from? For me, it's a combination. I'm strong in my faith, my spirituality, I love my family and I love to have fun with friends and family. And I believe that you have to be intentional or else it's easy to get distracted. Uh, when you continue on thinking about fitness, you talked about working out, it's easy to not work out if that's in a habit. If that's a habit that you have, it's super easy. Your finances. Inertia, yeah. Yeah. So for me personally, I would say it's my family that really drives me, really keeps me leveling up. I always ask people, uh, what are you consuming? Not just food, but people. Who are you surrounding yourself with? Jim Rohn, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Are yeah. you around negative Nancys, negative Nellies, negative Neds? Or are you around people that are go-givers? In the words of sure. Bob Berg's book, people that are that. doing big things and that are encouraging you, Hercules, Hercules, encouraging you to, to step your game up. So, so who are those five people for you? Who are your mentors? Yeah, Mark Winchester, Corey Richardson, Will Richardson. They're not related. John Pierre Bassor, my mom, my wife, my kids. That's my circle, my hype squad. I'm part of a hype squad. What's up, Cynthia Barnes? What's up, Ed Ross? What's up, Courtney Vigil? Uh, I would say my coach, Coach Kristen Frey. She holds me accountable. She helps me to look at new perspectives. I've, I've got a tight A-team. My A-team is, oh, they got me lifted up. They're supporting me, and, and I try my best to support them back. So, yeah. I got you. Okay, last question. Uh, Larry Long, 10 years old, um, asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I bet it wasn't a uh, keynote speaker. What was it? It was a professional basketball and football player. And my parents wouldn't even let me play football. I thought I was going to the NBA. I thought I was going to the NFL. I had dreams of, uh, of, of great athletic success. I ended up playing baseball at University of Maryland. Go Terps. And uh, nice. I got, I, got uh, I did not make the team. I got cut. Uh, at minor league spring training for the Dodgers and the Red Sox. They said, don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. Well, hey, that's, that's more impressive than, than what I got. I, uh, I, was, I was a high school phenomenon, but uh, college, I, I didn't get recruited. So um, I want to I wanna, I wanna, uh, thank you very much, Larry, for the time today. Um, I do want to give you a chance to, uh, to tell my audience Anywhere you want to send them, anything you want to promote, um, floor is yours. I appreciate it, Eric. Please find me and follow me. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Larry Long Jr. I got the smile for a mile. I got the gold mic in my profile. You can also check out my website, LarryLongJr.com. If you're on Amazon, you can find my book, Joke, Getting You Zapped Into Intentionality rediscover and believe in your inner greatness whatever i can do to serve you please let me know all right larry long the first guy i've ever had with three microphones <laughs> <laughs> uh, i appreciate you so much eric you know we are messing around <laughs> you are you are not messing around man 
Um, all right, man. Keep smiling, keep inspiring, and keep keep doing what you're doing because you're doing it right. Thank you, Eric. All right, you have a good day, all right? Bye. Bye-bye.